the next thing we're going to talk about, as Kev alluded to earlier, is that we're going to discuss Theresa May, who's been having a little bit of a renaissance. She's got a book coming out talking about malfeasance behind the scenes, essentially, trying to launder her own reputation. She's been given a bit of a renaissance in terms of the minds of the Liberals, right? Because she's one of the less bad Tories. And whilst I think it's true that she's not one of the worst Tories, she is, however, still a Tory. And not only did she, as a, an MP, continue to support the mer- policies that were put forward by the Cameron and Osborne administration, the worst administration of our lifetimes. She also was Home Secretary, sorry, and Prime Minister, were absolutely miserable. She has a horrendous track record on so many things. So for the Liberals to come out and girl boss her because she said like the Rwanda plan was bad, it just shows how how little you have to do as a Conservative for the Liberals who despise the party because it's the blue team rather than because their ideology is dog just shows how paper thin their criticisms are. You see all the time, right? Rory Stewart has his, all of his, his voting record in Parliament. People like David Gork and Anna Soubry completely have all of their many failures completely glossed over because they have the gall to be taking the right side on the only issue that matters to Liberals, which is indeed Brexit. So Theresa May is another one of the people who's being girl bossed by people who either weren't around for her horrendous legacy or just don't care because she agreed with them on what mattered to them. Uh, so so, you know, that is enough to never have any real criticisms of her in retrospect. She is on her own, again, reputation laundering mission with this book. And she's been doing interviews. One of them was with Ma. This one is titled that she regrets the hostile environment. So at least she has some contrition. Hostile envi- environment was an anti-immigrant policy platform and rhetorical platform, including massive vans that drove around saying go home on the side of them, which was about people who'd overstayed their visas. So she is a pretty awful individual, but at least she's showing some contrition given that the Prime Minister that preceded her was worse. She's clearly found a niche to have a way of making herself look better in comparison. Because again, people like Mick Hucknall, like we were talking about before, calling people like Ed Miliband a Marxist. All of the Liberal types are happy to vote Conservative to stop the Jam Man or Red Ed. But suddenly now Boris Johnson's happened, who supported very similar policies, actually less right-wing policies. His policy platform overall wasn't as bad as people like May and Cameron, but because he has worse vibes, he gets far more ire and has what soured them to the Conservative Party, rather than the actual meat of the utility of the policy. She's managed to get off scot-free from real criticism from people who are completely politically ignorant. But let's watch her try and launder her reputation with Ma and then we'll move on to Osborne and Balls. When you were Home Secretary, that use of the phrase hostile environment was one of those things you now regret. Can you explain again to people listening why you used the phrase and why you regret it? Yes, and I wasn't the first person to use it. In fact, previous Labour government had had used it Mm. as well. And it was used to describe... And that, again, in the minds of Liberals, just lets her off, right? Oh, okay. well, the red team and blue team did it, so whatever. Because the red team and blue team are both bad. They both do bad things. They both go on with this reactionary rhetoric. Just because Labour did it doesn't mean that it suddenly means that every Conservative also does it is somehow let off the hook. Yeah, Blair and Brown monsters well. Obviously Brown far less so. Yeah, but Blunkett was Home Secretary most likely at the time. And Blunkett is an absolutely evil piece of sh- The environment we wanted to set for those who were here illegally. Mm. Um, it's only fair to people who come here legally that people who are here illegally are not able to if you like, carry on living a life as if they've come here legally. And so it was aimed at a particular group of people. What, of course, happened was it came by some to be interpreted as more generally applying Mm. to to people uh, who had come in to, to live in the country. And that was a mistake because that was never what was intended. And language is very important in these things without trying to get into the actual policy behind it. What do you think of some of the language being used by some of your successors, the current Home Secretary, for instance, about migrants being an invasion, those kind of things? Because language does matter. Well, it's not... The- just remember, the EHRC declared that the hostile environment policy broke uh, uh, equalities law. And also what's worse about it is even uh, whilst also you know, influencing xenophobia and racism in this country and empowering those groups of people, it also actually failed on delivering any of the things that it wanted to do. All it did was drive the forces of reaction and give them sucker rather than actually dealing with any issues to do with people staying put longer than their visas had them the official licence to stay here for the language that I would use and and I have made one or two points about some of the... And as Bilderberg points out in chat, there are countless stories of people who were here legally and the Home Office found they were made an administrative error and decided they were illegal, turning their lives upside down. Wind the Windrush scandal, that's her... 
fault as well people whose documents just got completely lost so they were just treated as not having leave to remain treated like they they should be deported back to countries that they don't even remember because it was because of their parents as well absolute kind of sick policy that is the direct result of the failures of the kind of rhetoric that led to things like the hostile environment as well these liberal types who voted for uh david cameron who voted for theresa may because they were happy to see their, their house prices increase because they were never affected by the after effects of austerity. And, you know, they, they liked the vibes of May and Cameron because they were too politically ignorant to actually investigate the policies of these people and the real you, uh, negative utility of the policies they employed. Or they didn't vote for Theresa May, not because of anything she did as Home Secretary, not because of any economic policies of austerity that were continued by Philip Hammond. Oh, no, none of that. Oh, but because she had the Brexit deal and that's all that mattered to these people. And believe me, obviously, I'm not going to help her launder her Brexit deal either she's been in the papers all of this week as well saying that her brexit deal was better than boris johnson when her Bre brexit deal had the same stupid red lines that he had I mean, all her red white and blue brexit a no deal is better than a bad deal nonsense that led to us to continue to have brexit policy there's even there's only marginal difference a tiny like the whiskers difference between the boris johnson brexit deal and the theresa may deal which because of again her red lines to try and give lend too much credence to the power of the erg within the conservative parliamentary party that's her fault as well and she has the, the nerve the cheek to go under the papers talking about how her deal was better than boris's deal when it was only marginally different and still had all the stupid red lines involved and there was another phrase used by robert jenrick about cannibalizing the compassion of the british people which i thought was a strange phrase yes i mean the, the british people have always been welcoming to people who are refugees who are fleeing persecution. Mm. Obviously, what we see from a lot of people migrating to the country illegally is they're economic migrants. They're yeah. not fleeing persecution in the sense that one would normally recognise a refugee. I none of the people, none of the people coming across the channel can be economic migrants because if they're economic migrants, they'd be getting visas and they'd be staying past their visa. That's what most illegal immigrants are in this country because that is actual illegal act of immigration. It's when you have a visa and then you overstay it. Those are actual illegal immigrants because if you land on the beaches on a small boat and you declare asylum that is entirely legal up until the point where your asylum claim is rejected and then you don't leave the country and that happens in vanishingly few cases because most actually get accepted at up to 70 percent, i believe it is and then most who fail do either get extradited leave voluntarily or there is some kind of returns agreement in place as well so this idea that the the there are economic migrants coming across the channel is just completely asinine it's complete nonsense but of course, Brexit means Brexit indeed, which is the amount of knowledge about Brexit that Theresa May had. Because actually, the funny fact is that most of the time when Theresa May was negotiating Brexit, her own negotiating team didn't actually negotiate. They had to be taught by the EU negotiators how the European Union worked. Um, let me turn, if I may, to Brexit, which was the, the thing really at the heart of your prime ministership, those awful, awful weeks when you were trying to get uh, a, a gentler deal, if I can put it that way, through the House of Commons. And by your account in this book, there was almost a kind of conspiracy by hardcore Remainers who just didn't want anything to do with Brexit at all, led by the then Speaker of the House, John Burko, on the one side, and hardcore Brexiters who wanted the hardest possible Brexit. And together, they scuppered your deal, which you think would have made this country more prosperous and happy. It wasn't even like a soft Brexit deal. There was complete removal of any access to the European common markets in, in total, like no single market, no customs union, no EFTA, no nothing. There was just... A a different policy on Northern Ireland slightly, which then got ch swapped around with Boris Johnson, who then also admitted to um, Ian Paisley Jr. they had no intention of keeping the Northern Ireland Protocol and was going to renegotiate it anyway. Right? There was barely any difference at all. But actually, the, the ERG hard Brexit types just completely rejected the Northern Ireland Protocol. That was the sticking point. And it's still the sticking point to this day. Reform UK bang on a, all on, over and over and over again about how the Windsor framework splits up the United Kingdom by having Northern Ireland in a separate economic zone even though it's more beneficial for them. She's not wrong in saying that hardcore Remainers kept voting down soft Brexit deals, but the soft Brexit deals that they voted down in the meaningful votes were Jeremy Corbyn proposing a closer relationship with Europe than Theresa May's Brexit deal, and Ken Clark proposing a relationship with the European Union that was closer than May's Brexit deal. So the idea that Theresa May is the one who should be feeling aggrieved with the hardcore Remainers blocking soft Brexit, it wasn't even her amendment that was being blocked by them that was closer to the EU. It was Ken Clark and it was Jeremy Corbyn.
Well, I was very clear when I uh, became Prime Minister that I needed to deliver Brexit because the majority had voted for that. It was a democratic will of the people. But it was a close vote. Mm. And therefore, I always thought we should do it in a way that recognised the concerns that the 48% remainers... A sort of uh, softer don't... Brexit, a, a, as a softer in, the, Brexit. in the words. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and, yes, I mean, I used to get slightly frustrated at the terms hard and soft Brexit. Mm. Oh, how is she here trying to say she was saying soft Brexit? She was your red lines. You were the one saying no deal is better than a bad deal. You were the one who kept no deal on the table and also had still delivered hard Brexit. I, I, I'm losing my mind here. Yeah, Theresa May is not a girl boss. She's awful. She proposed loads of awful policies. I've not even gone over her being officially found in contempt of parliament. I'm not even going to go over the fact that under Theresa May's premiership, we restarted uh, the selling of weapons for to Saudi Arabia for them to commit crimes in Yemen. And she also voted through austerity. She supported all of that stuff right when she was a cabinet minister during the George Osborne years. And Philip Hammond continued that during all that period as well. She's not a girl boss. She's awful. She's just slightly less awful than Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson. And if that's your metric where you start girl bossing politicians, you need a reality check. You need to actually look at history. You need to learn how politics works. You never have like a tiny little smidgen, some one little, an infinitesimal amount of political nous to understand that you these people are not people that you should be Stanning, okay? You should not stan Theresa May. Now, another person that you shouldn't be standing is George Osborne, because he was the actual architect of the policies that Theresa May waved through that led to countless suffering, that led to, to a UN rapporteur claiming that we had human, violated the human rights of the disabled in the UK under George Osborne's premiership, where austerity led to up to 330,000 deaths in this country, where we sold off Royal Mail, where we refused to fix our schools, we cut back the school building programme, so that we're now looking at a point to which schools might collapse on children's heads, where the NHS had all of its budgets not increased to the point where we could cope potentially with a pandemic because loads of pandemic stuff got cut back because they were preparing for the wrong pandemic as we found out during the COVID inquiry and both both David Cameron and George Osborne completely unrepentant about austerity completely unrepentant we know from their trials their trials by the COVID inquiry they're unrepentant about getting the nation's finances under control at the expense of our pandemic preparedness and the NHS capacity which they continually failed on you should not be standing these people just because they kept your mortgage rate low and increased your house price like every liberal liberal who voted for david cameron in 2015 because he looked prime ministerial because red ed might ruin the country as the marxist that he is right these absolute charlatans who refuse to criticize these people for all of the bad things that they did run right? and who will happily let George Osborne launder his reputation, which is what he's now promoting on GMB. And I was going to promote here his new podcast with Ed Balls, the shadow chancellor who agreed with his austerity cuts at the time in 2015, of course, which is not particularly read Ed like we were told. So uh, we'll watch him try and launder his reputation now on Good Morning Britain. Nice and cosy, nice and cosy here with the Good Morning Britain crew. I mean, literally, this is Ed Balls being hired by ITV to promote his own podcast. That's why we, people keep talking, there's like a rigged game. It's an old boys club full of people checking each other off. Yes, George has even described Ed as his frenemy. Uh, and they have a new podcast which launches tomorrow. Does it mark the end of this bitter political divide? We're going to speak to George Osborne. What, what's political divide? They both agreed on the same cuts in 2015. These people agree with each other. Any ideological differences between the two are incredibly infinitesimal because they both have broadly the same political outlook on neoliberalism. But the fact that they, they wore the different colour rosettes, so this makes them diametrically opposed to each other in liberal land. Very good morning to you. <laughs> There will be people who think, and it's really a question to both of you, actually, you are known as the austerity chancellor. You might not like that, or you may be proud of it. I don't know. Which one? Well, I'm proud of the decisions we took to try and fix the economy, which includes... Yes, he... Your 330,000 lives were worth it for the economy. The red line went up, so your lives are meaningless and forfeit. What's he telling you right now? All 330,000 people who lost their lives because of his policy were worth it to make the line go up. Welcome to capitalism, friends. Included being tough on public spending. Yeah. Yes, public spending, which led to cuts for um, all sorts of people, including, you know, those who are the poorest, of course. That's that's the, well, the concern, is that you were... Tell him he killed 330,000 people. He did that. His policies did that. Particularly tough on those who were in receipt of benefits, things like the two-child policy, the bedroom... Disabled cuts. Human rights violations of the disabled. It's your job. It's your job to tell these people to their face the things that they have done and criticise them for here. If anybody else killed 330,000 people, you'd rightfully call them a mass murderer. 
That's more people than Idi Amin. And yet you're here saying, oh, it's bad for these people. Give it to him straight. Make him justify human rights violations of the disabled. Make him justify it, Susanna. Tax ...that you really sort of took a scythe to public spending. And with that in mind, there are people watching who would think, for you, how on earth can you get over that politically? But he agreed with him. He agreed with keeping the cuts in 2015. There was a unity in deficit reduction and public spending reduction of the 2015 election. These people are ideologically the same. Well, first of all, I would still defend the decisions we took then. Of course you would. Because the country had no money. There were, the, you remember the... It's true. The, the sovereign government that has its own currency ran out of money. The credit card was maxed out. Except we did have money because the debt-to-GDP ratio it continually increased under George Osborne, right? It continually increased because he was using quantitative easing to give his mates in the financial sector a, fis a financial bung to be able to continue to increase asset prices and increase house prices and things like that to be able to screw over working-class people while deliberately... These people deliberately squished working class people's wages to ensure their purchasing power wouldn't stay high so that we could keep inflation low. Well, it was supply side labour market policy deliberately to stagnate workers' wages where we are poorer now than we were in 2010 in real terms. He is the architect of class war in this country. More than Rishi Sunak, more than Boris Johnson, more than Theresa May, more than any of these people, this is the ultimate class warrior. This letter, there's no money left, which is what greeted us when we arrived in the Treasury. And we took difficult decisions, but that period of British history now, some years ago, you know, was one where the British economy stabilised, jobs were created, and I would say the poorest in society saw actually their income start to rise and weren't put on the unemployment rolls as they were in other countries after the financial crash. But obviously the decisions were... Yes, that was due to quantitative easing and stimulus from the Brown administration, who put money in the economy to ensure that it didn't collapse, that you then cut away. ...difficult, because... If you try and tell people, as you know, you'll find today with politicians, there's no money left and we have to make tough decisions about what you want to spend the money on or we're going to have to increase taxes and people don't want to pay more in tax. Rich people don't want to pay more in tax, right? And that's who you care about. It's only caring about rich people. In fact, you cut the 50p in the pound tax rate. You cut taxes for rich people. If, if you confront people with those choices, they're often... I wouldn't say they're unpopular because the, what I'd say, Sam, is... Yeah, the end... or indeed engage in fiscal expansion when interest rates were 0.25%. At this period where we confronted the nation with those Choices, they re-elected us. You know, the, when, when they got the chance to say, do we want to have this lot again, they said yes. In the 2015... Yeah, true, because people... You taught the people in this country they shouldn't care about the disabled and the poor, and they lapped it up because you made their house prices increase. You made a political calculation that you could sacrifice poor people, not metaphorically, at, like, in reality, to sacrifice poor people for the great god of middle-class people's house rises. I'm not surprised they elected you. Sociopathic king failed state this country is. In, in an election. election. So I, th I think politicians today are too nervous, maybe we'll come on and talk about this, on the, you know, of telling people, you know what, triple lock on pensions or benefits going up by 8%, we can't afford it this year. You, and I, I, I think you, mm. you get more credit than, than politicians reckon with the public and people are listening to this programme, they are not stupid, they perfectly mm. well understand that things have to be paid for and taxes are already very high and so... Yes, the, the economy is literally like a household budget and it's never not been like... That's exactly how government spending works. We just had no money left, we had to cut it. This, I'm sorry, this very simplistic and completely unrealistic version of how public finances works that you lied to people. We continue to lie to people about this and you have total media control to which you be able to lie, lie about this to people. This, this guy used to be editor of the Evening Standard, by the way, so he literally had the power to shape public opinion on how... on to lie to them on how public spending works. Absolute f***ing monster this man is. In back then, I think we got credit for telling people okay. the truth. Um, so, it, it, a couple of the things which you were criticised for, uh, objective medical assessment for the disability living allowance, various reforms to housing benefit, tax credits, mm. freezing rates of child benefit, a two-year mm. pay freeze for public sector workers, housing benefit reduced, income level for family tax credits changed, and some mm. people would say long-term impact, for instance, yeah. on the NHS, schools, we've just had the concrete ceiling crisis, which is now ongoing, blamed on your austerity budget. Well, Are there ever moments... 330,000 people... Human rights violations of the disabled. Fair play, at least she is putting it out there, the things that he cut in factual terms. What about the impact? What was the real impact of this? Whose lives were affected? Moments where you look back and go, I just cut people to the quick. No, because... Look, look I'm not saying we got everything right, but... You know, faced with a financial crash, it was the biggest crash in our lifetimes, right? And it affected countries all over the world. 
And those countries that had a clear plan, like Britain at the time, uh, under the David Cameron government, did do better. We recovered. The economy grew. No, no, People no, no. Scott, Gordon Brown was the one who fixed it through quantitative easing. You then continued it to to engage in class war. Stop just be doing historical revisionism. The economy only grew and a very, we had very low growth at a time when we could have had super speedy growth, when we had incredibly low interest rates to continue this stuff, to build an economy fit for the future. And then the pandemic happened and because of your failure to invest, the country collapsed. Literally, schools collapsed because of your failure to invest at times in which fiscal expansion was the, was the cheapest it had ever been in this country's lifetime. Well, more jobs were created under the Cameron government than any British government in history. And all that, you know, when I was a yeah, child... Yeah, because we'd lost loads of jobs due to the, the great global financial crisis, right? The GFC took, absolutely gutted a bunch of middle-class jobs out of the economy. Though they were always going to be in the necessary way that got economies grow after crashes. Those were never going to come back. To try and say that that was somehow... A, a result of the policies that you engage in rather than natural state of the business cycle is complete again that you have no proof of any of the things that you did to be able to make that happen unemployment was the big issue mm -hmm. it was not an issue despite the massive crash and that's because we had a plan and some of those decisions we took were controversial uh of course but you can't say i'm gonna you know i'm gonna cut spending i'm gonna like make sure the state mm -hmm. doesn't borrow too much and then say, but I'm not going to touch benefits and I'm not going to touch public services and I'm not going to touch... You can't do it because... And don't cut. Don't cut the 50p tax. That's what you public... You don't spending... think that the we, gap we did... between the rich and the poor it, it became didn't. bigger? It that those not. with the broadest shoulders didn't the do most controversial what decision. they could have done to help? The most the decisions that, that generated the most noise when I was in TV mm. studios like this back then were things like taking child benefit away from the richest people. The top 15% of the society country now they wouldn't regard themselves as rich and some of them are on incomes you know where they're still struggling mm. to get through but those were the really controversial decisions university fees that was the thing that created a big right even though people who go to university end up getting much better because you know why all of the cuts to poor people never got any kind of actual noise is because nobody cares about the poor the media don't care about the poor Whilst I believe that it was right to, to protest against student fees, I think student fees are far too high. Why would any newspaper ever want to publish human interest pieces about the poor? Because that doesn't, that's not political capital, is it? You don't get any political capital for that. And even then, there were stories about this, right? Again, there was loads of coverage of David Clapson. I'm going to remind you again, I will repeat, I've said the same phrase like five or six times on stream, but I will repeat it again for posterity because it's so important. David Clapson's face is burnt into my retinas. A man who because he missed a job centre assessment, so he had his benefits cut, so he couldn't pay for his meter to cool his insulin, and he died with no money in his bank account and with hypoglycemia. That was a man who was killed by this government, no less, through policies that he endorsed. I will never let that man's face ever be forgotten, because he is, quite frankly, the poster child of the absolutely democidal policies of, of the government that you were the second in command for, George. How dare you say you're making necessary choices? Or that people didn't care and they only cared about student fees? How f dare you? I resist calling Clapson's death a tragedy. Tragedy suggests a one-off incident, a rarity that couldn't be prevented. What was done to Clapson and it was done, not something that simply happened, is a particularly horrific example of what has almost silently turned into a widespread crisis. More than a million people in this country have had their benefits stopped over the past year. Sanctions against chronically ill and disabled people have risen 580%. This is a system out of control. But I remember on the, you know, I used to say to the BBC, you have asked me more questions on interviews on all sorts of your programmes about taking child benefit away from the top 15% of the country. I mean, it's a failure of the BBC. That doesn't mean that you did things correctly, right? Just because the BBC aren't asking about the disabled people that you decided when you were in charge, right? Just because they weren't asking about it doesn't mean that people didn't care. Being media hack journalists who don't care about poor people are the same as you who also doesn't care about poor people. A freezing tax credits for the bottom 15%. And I think that's... And, and you are more focused on asking students to pay more money, even though students tend to come off, come mm. from better off uh, sections of society. What? Students come from all, all, all types of backgrounds. And the arguments against student fees is that would hit poor people even worse. What are you talking about? Then you are about some... You, you, cut, you cut maintenance grants as well. You cut the nurse's bursary, which is an excellent way of getting working-class people qualifications they can use to make sure that they have a you know a, a reasonably well-paying job you cut that it was you that was you that did that difficult decisions we've had to take uh for lower income people and and i you know i guess it you know it's an interesting now you know i've been out of politics for many years now 
Um, but I kind of reflect on how that coverage, you know, yeah. was at the well, time. Well, you, you say that. I couldn't possibly comment because I don't know what coverage you're mm. referring to. I would defend journalists in their oh. uh, efforts to scrutinise what you did. I, I, I will I... not. They did a f***ing terrible job. They did a miserable job because they're all from the same team. They're all from the same clubs, from the same schools. This man was an editor of the Evening Standard, right? How do you think he got that job? Just through chance? No, it's because he had the right connections and the right people in the right jobs. That's why none of the journalists properly held him to account. If you put yourself in the shoes of the job that I did as Chancellor, or, you know, Ed was in the Treasury as well, you have a very straightforward choice, which is, yes, you can spend more money in the NHS, you can spend more money on pensions, you can spend more money on the army, more money on the police. The money has to come from somewhere. Of course. And it's not going to come... Fiscal expansion, the 50p tax rate. ..from billionaire oligarchs, which is always the answer. It's going to come from working people. That's how you pay... Yeah, it's not going to come from billionaire oligarchs because you're, they're your mates and you don't want to wealth tax them. <laughs> ..for the large amount of public services we have in this country. And then when someone suggests paying more tax, Rishi Sunak last year said, I want to increase people's national insurance. And the Labour politicians and the Conservative politicians who didn't support him came on the shows like this and said, we shouldn't be paying more tax. Mm. And no, people on the bottom, right? Regressive taxes, no. Progressive taxes, yes. Why, are no, why is nobody, literally no party other than the Green Party, proposing progressive taxes in this country? But apparently Michael Gove now, who's apparently more left-wing than Rachel Reeves on this. And then you're stuck in the Treasury with that political... Because it disproportionately political affects those who are at the lower end of earnings. A, it's a political reality. We are in the one-year anniversary of the Liz Truss quasi quartan budget. And that was a budget where you... Have you, do you... have you heard this rhetoric before? We can't do fiscal stimulus because Liz Truss crashed the economy. Can you remember what shadow chancellor this sounds like? Where the sums didn't add up where they said, you know what, we're going to borrow this money. We're going to spend more. We're not going to ask you to pay more tax, in fact. We're... And people criticise me to say that how dare you try and compare Rachel Reeves to George Osborne. This is identical rhetoric, right? We can't engage in fiscal expansion because of trust and quarting. Doesn't matter what it's for or what it's on or what the plans are or what the forecasts are, we just can't do it. This trust happened, fiscal expansion bad. This is identical rhetoric to Rachel Reeves. And these two people have sown it into the public consciousness. The Labour Party have taken the Keynesian consensus that could easily have come out of the failure of the Conservative government and they have flushed it down the toilet. This country is dead, it's finished, it's buried, it's good. It's gone. It's never coming back. We're going to cut your taxes and we're going to borrow more. And it was an economic disaster. Mm. Complete disaster. And... Oh, and well, there's the connection then. OK, so you are united, both of you, opposite sides of the political divide. But when it came to the... what ended up being called the Kamikaze budget, yeah. but those you are, are united you that that was a disaster. But those are the lessons you learn. The only things which last in a society are the things which become agreed upon. So Bank of England independence, mm -hmm. the national minimum wage, the Conservatives opposed it in 1997, George ended up boasting about raising the national minimum wage, and both of us look at what Liz Truss did around Bank of England or um, the, the... Oh yes, move, move, get out, get out. This country is... I don't think this country can be fixed. The political consensus is such, and the, the failed state of the country is such that I think this country country is going down the sh**. I really do. Cheers. We had, well, I was mentioning student fees. Peter Mandelson came to me when I was shadow <clears> chancellor <throat> and said, we want to put up student fees. It's too controversial for a Labour government. Why don't we set up a review that's going to recommend to whoever forms the next government uh, that they should go up? And See? I can imagine on pen... It's a big club and you're not in it. Doesn't matter what political flag you wear or the rosette you wear, there are multiple different parties who all flag under the same banner and they don't care about you and they're mates with each other and they do dodgy deals in the background to ensure the same political consensus. Peter Oborn is correct and he called it a, a... They're not working for the public. They're working together in a conspiracy against the public. Those are Peter Oborn's own words and it's difficult to disagree. Pensions, you could try and get some kind of cross-body thing. It's tough because pensioners vote. They're a very, very important part of and the... they just... They say, oh, it's just absolutely fine, yeah. Just, you know, Peter Mandelson came to me and said, should we consolidate on this together? And I said, yeah, that's fine. He just says it like it's so normal. This isn't normal. This is a conspiracy against the public. This isn't... No it shouldn't be normal. And because, see, of course, this man's never had a Greg Sutter droll before, right? He's never lived the life of normal people because he's had a life of inordinate privilege from birth until now. That he lives in so much in of this sealed bubble of the Westminster political life that, yeah, it, of course, of course, 
he thinks it's normal for politicians to collude. If I watch any more of this, I'm going to actually burst a blood vessel. So we'll leave it there. That was excruciating. I hate everybody. Uh, and I am now extremely blackpilled and I hope you all are too. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking and subscribing. It does help out the channel and the algorithm. And if you click the bell notification icon, it will let you know when I go live and when I upload videos. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my handle is at NoJusticeMTG and that is Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch and YouTube. If you want to support my channel in a more financial manner, you can do so by becoming a member for just 99p, by super chatting, or by supporting me on Patreon, with the link is in the description of this video, and hopefully I'll catch you on the next segment.